Hello everyone, it's Benny, and welcome back to the 3D Game Engine tutorial series. Now, at this point we've just finished the Wolfenstein 3D clone tutorial series, and that also means we have our big list of notes, all the things we've found just to be horribly wrong with our 3D engine in that series, things that caused us problems, things that ultimately caused that series to be a little bit of a messy project. I'm... yeah. I talked all about that in that series, not gonna repeat it here, but yeah, it could've worked out better. We need quite a few things to make our engine, well, be more friendly to 3D development. And that's what we're going to start in this video. We're gonna start building an engine architecture based on all of these notes that we took. And w once we do that, we're gonna implement it and Hopefully, if it all goes according to plan, our engine should be that much more friendly to development, to game development, because of it. So, I'm going to start with our two big topics. I've already got a plan, I've already figured things out, I'm not going to be improvising, so don't worry. I do have a plan. And I'm starting with our big topics, the rendering engine and the physics engine. Of all the small little things that caused us problems with the Wolf 3D series, the two biggest things that ended up biting us, or we don't have a rendering engine, we just have some rendering utilities, and we don't have a physics engine. So, let's go ahead and add that to our board. Rendering engine and physics engine. So, those are two things, and they do pretty much exactly what you'd expect. The rendering engine is going to take in some arbitrary list of 3D data and how to draw it, and it's going to use OpenGL, do some fancy rendering techniques, take some lighting, do some all, all that stuff, and, well, render the image. Render all our objects. Our physics engine, on the other hand, is going to take our huge arbitrary list of objects and figure out when things interact, when things collide, and it's going to figure out what should happen when things interact and collide. And this is going to eventually end up including to some extent, things like triggers, like the player walks into a room and then all of a sudden he's entered some trigger and all the bad guys are going to jump out on him, you know, stuff like that too. So it's a little bit more general than just, you know, the Newtonian stuff you learned in physics class, but, you know, it's going to handle those types of things. But if you're keen, you might have already noticed there's a bit of a problem here. These two things aren't exactly doing... how should I say this? What they're doing conflicts a little bit, I'll put it that way. They're both interacting with the same arbitrary list of 3D data, and, well, depending on when these things happen, there could be a bit of a problem. If I'm starting to do physics simulation while I'm in the middle of drawing things, that could be a little bit weird. <laughs> so, this is this alone is not going to give us an effective engine architecture. It's gonna it's gonna help, technically, <laughs> but we need a little bit more than this. So here's what I've eventually come up with after some thought. We're going to have a core engine. This is almost going to be like a big, gigantic clock. It's going to have some timing, and it's going to tell when the rendering engine should trigger and do its thing, when the physics engine should trigger and do its thing. It's going to manage things like multi-threading, if we need to do some multi-threaded execution with this stuff. And I have kept thread safety in mind to an extent when I was designing this, so we should be able to do some stuff with we should be able to do some things with multi-threading later on, so don't worry about that. And yeah, so that's what it's going to do. It's going to basically be like a big gigantic clock, deciding when the rendering engine should fire, when the physics engine engine should fire, etc., etc., and things go back and forth. And whoops, and they can end up interacting with each other with, with each other and how they need to through the core engine. So, for example, the physics engine is going to do some bunch of big fancy calculations. It's going to figure out, oh hey, this object is now in this position, they've bounced off some things, some things have triggered, wh whatever. The rendering engine is going to be able to get that updated information and draw the more accurate scene because of it. So, you know, it's a bit of an interaction going on here, a bit of back and forth. And that's what the core engine for is. It's for clock, it's for a clock deciding when things should happen, and for deciding how things should interact. But, of course, there's a little bit of a problem here. Still, at this point, we have our way of interacting with this big, gigantic list of objects, but we don't have the game. So, ultimately, we're going to have a game. And it's going to be completely separate from the system of rendering engine, physics engine, clock cycle, nonsense. It's going to be something different. This is what the 
end user of the 3D engine is going to be creating. They're going to be creating the game. They're going to be able to plug it in, and yeah, they're going to be able to interact, do some back and forth with the game and the engine through the core engine, because again, that's sort of like the central point. It's called the core engine for a reason. But the game is separate. It's its, its own entity. And this is sort of going to be our primary architecture. The game is its separate thing. It's supplied by the user, and it's going to Ultimately, its role is going to be to supply that big, gigantic list of 3D data which can be interacted with with physics and rendered, and also provide the list, I should say, relevant information about how it should interact and how it should be rendered. So that we know, hey, this object should have lighting, but this object shouldn't have lighting because it's this big, gigantic ball that's shooting out light or whatnot, you know. Or, hey, this object shouldn't interact with physics, it should let things bounce off of it, but it shouldn't move because it's part static, and this door, it should be able to bounce things off, and it should also be able to move itself, and you know, I don't know, I'm just making the examples up, but that's the idea. This is going to be our central architecture that we're going to implement. Because, and not only does it provide the rendering engine, not only does it provide the physics engine, but it covers a couple things on our big gigantic list here. For example, if I can find it, I know it's on here, Okay, well, somewhere in here, I have some way... Ah, here it is. Some way to separate game and engine data. The game isn't going to have to know about any of the engine data. It's not going to have to conform to the engine structure. Whoa. Not, not like it's had to do before, like it using the engine's classes, like the engine's provided game class or anything. There's, They'll be separated. They'll be independent. The core engine will be able to do its thing regardless of what game we've given to it. And... There's a few other things on here. You can look through it. I'm going to actually upload the notes onto GitHub at some point. But yeah. Now at this point, we have a complete architecture. We could jump into the code right now, create a core engine, which has the big gigantic clock and interaction code. We have the rendering engine, which has all our rendering stuff. We have our physics engine, which has all what little physics stuff we do have. We can move the game stuff into its own game system, have them all interact, and there you go. We could do this right now. But there's one more thing that I'd like to talk about. One more problem, if you will. And it's with the game. I said the game's going to have this big, gigantic list of 3D data, which can be rendered and it can be interacted with with the physics engine, and the physics engine would simulate how it interacts and whatnot. But I haven't really talked... Well, we haven't really set up a way to represent that data. That's what I should be saying. I mean, we don't have any way to represent data that should be part of our game. All of our stuff right now is really engine stuff. So at this point, we need to sort of take a little bit of a step back and think of how we're going to represent all this game data. But don't worry, I've already got an idea for you. But if you don't like the way I've done it, and I'm going to talk about some of the pros and cons of doing it the way I have when we're implementing it, but it's important to think about this because depending on how you set this up, this is going to be... it's gonna... how should I put this? Depending on how you set this up, it's a trade-off. On one end, you can make it really easy to set up an engine that uses it. On the other end, yeah, you can set it up so that it's really easy to build a game out of it. There's a bit of a trade-off here. I think I've done a decent job of the trade-off. I think I've... well, obviously I wouldn't be doing it, but... You know, this isn't the be-all, end-all solution to this. This is an open question. There's certainly different ways of doing it, and depending on what you're doing, there might be much, much better ways to do it. I'm going to be doing a very general-purpose solution to this how to represent all of the 3D data that's part of our game problem. And it's with a scene graph. And how this is going to work is all, all the objects in our game are going to be divided into nodes. Nodes that have information for the rendering engine and information for the physics engine, information the engine needs to actually process it. That's what the nodes are going to have. There's going to be a big, gigantic hierarchy of this, of these, and each node, in turn, will inherit some of the properties of the last one. So, for example, I could have my initial node, put it at some location, and the next node, like this node right here, that's going to start at that position, for instance. And then I can move relative to the position of the first object, and I can have sort of a hierarchy of positions there. And you can do some very interesting things with that. That's just one use. You can also have them inherit rendering qualities, physics qualities, you know. It's a tree. <laughs> okay, if, you, if you've done any decent amount of programming, you probably know how 
trees of inheritance and stuff work if if you do an any amount of object-oriented programming, I should say. It's kind of like that. Except, well, it's sort of data inheritance, and... Well, I shouldn't say data inheritance. I guess that's technically data inheritance, too, but... You'll see what I mean. We aren't going to be implementing this with actual, like, the extends keyword in Java. No. You'll see. And the trick could look something like this. This is just an example. But yeah. And now that sort of simplifies the problem. Now all we need to know is how do we represent these nodes which store all the data. And we know how we're going to organize the nodes, but how do we represent them? And I've come up with this. Again, this is a trade-off. It's not... This isn't the be-all, end-all solution. And depending on what you're doing, there could be much, much better ways to organize your data. I'm having it in a game object. And this this is pretty much what the node is going to be. They're going to be game objects. That's how it's going to have the physics data, the rendering engine data, all that stuff. And the way it's going to store that is in components. They're going to have some components, which is going to contain the logic for the physics engine, some component which has logic for the rendering engine, and some components which have how the object should actually behave in the game. They're all going to be done in this big, gigantic list of components they can have, which could have nothing. It could have a whole bunch of things. And that's really how it's going to work. The game object itself isn't going to have much data. It's just going to be mostly a transform. But through this list of components, we'll be able to customize it, tell it how it should interact with the physics engine, or with the rendering engine, if at all, and then ultimately be able to produce something meaningful from all of that. And that is the engine architecture in a nutshell. So, at this point, I'd just like to talk briefly about how much of this we're actually going to implement in this segment, because clearly, we can't build a perfect version of this in this segment, or indeed in this entire series. This is, like I said, a big open problem. There's no right solution to this. And some solutions work better depending on what you're doing. So, what we're mostly going to be doing, we're going to be implementing our scene graph with our big gigantic list of trees, and we're going to be segmenting out our the engine technology we have right now into the physics engine, the core engine, and rendering engine systems. So that later on, we can go in and we can modify it in sort of like the final well, architecture. We're going to be organizing things into the architecture, but we're not going to be going really in-depth in, well, how all the individual parts of the architecture work. Like, we're not going to go in-depth on all the stuff the rendering engine is going to ultimately do as part of the architecture. We're not going to go in-depth on all the things the physics engine is going to do as part of the architecture. It's just organization. Putting everything in the system so that we're better prepared to actually have a working game engine by the end of this. And that's what we're going to be doing. I know we didn't do coding in this video, so sorry if that disappointed you, but this is really one of those things where it's really critically important to understand the big picture of things. And that's why I've done the video like this. If we, I just jumped in and started coding this, you'd be wondering what on earth I was doing for the next five or ten videos. So, yeah. That's what we're going to be doing. And also, hopefully, this has given you some thought as to... And I explained this next part horribly, so let's try that again. The thing is, with the game, you have to keep in mind... When you're setting up your game, this is going to be the user model. This is what, if you're setting out your game as in front of a big game development team, this is what those people are going to be interacting with. They're going to be interacting with this scene graph and this list of components. If you're setting up a visual editor for your 3D engine, like some people have asked me about, this is what the editor would be doing. It would be giving the user ways to construct the scene graph and add components to game objects. All the engine stuff is sort of like the back end. This is, the game is what the user is actually seeing, all the scene graph and game object stuff. That's why I'm harping on this, you have to be very careful with how you design this so much. Because, well, depending on what you're doing, this might not be the user model for, well, what you're doing, whatever you're setting up your game engine for. So, fr based on some other engines out there and some, well, just some of my personal experience of game development, this model does end up working out pretty well for a very large number of games. This is a good way of doing game development in a lot of cases, but it is not the ultimate solution.
if you're setting up, I don't know, maybe you're setting up a game engine that's only going to be used for developing first-person shooter games. I don't know. This might not be the best model for you. Maybe you want instead, okay, there's not a scene graph, but there's worlds, and there's the world and entities. The, you create the level, that's the world, and then everything that goes in the level is an entity, and people can run around. Some entity might be a box of bullets, and it might be a monster, and the world's like the building and terrain and whatnot. You know, that might be a better model for that. I don't know. I'm making that up off the top of my head. That might be a terrible model for it. But, I don't know. I'm just... that. That's why I'm bringing this up so much. Keep in mind when you're doing this, the game is your user's end model for the 3D engine. If you're going to develop a game with this 3D engine, then you will be interacting with the scene graph and the list of game objects. You'll be interacting with whatever model you set for your game. And hopefully, as the series goes on, you'll start to see where this falters and where this shines, I guess. So thank you, hope you enjoyed, hope you learned, and see you next time, where we'll start implementing this.